this is a practical view into interactive storytelling. Um, for starters, I'll give a, just a very quick uh, bio of myself. Probably you don't know me, so I think it's always good introducing myself. I'm from Argentina. Uh, I developed a Football Deluxe, which is considered to be one of the first games in Latin America to get a worldwide deal distribution. Uh, I worked at Gameloft, the mobile game developer. Uh, very interesting company, yet not much freedom to create interesting games. And I produced uh, advert games at, game, at Three Melons, which is a great studio. We made games for Coca-Cola, Sony, Disney, and very interesting projects. Right now I'm independent. I'm starting up a new company. And if you want to know more about myself and what I think about games, you can guess through the title of my blog, gamesareart.com. You can log in there anytime to, to reach me. Well, it's a practical view into interactive storytelling. The first statement I would like to make today is I rather prefer the term drama games. Interactive storytelling has been used for a long time. It's uh, almost in the birth of this industry. But drama games is like a fresh, a fresh way to, to call this special space of, of game development. And I must attribute this term to from the person from her, I first hear it from, from that is Patrick Duggan, who, oh, there you are. Um, I think drama games has a more broader appeal, uh, has a more commercial sense to it, and it has drama, by saying drama games, you're implicitly saying that games are art, so sounds sounds better. I prefer that term. So it's a practical view and not a theoretical view. We all know that lots of books have been written about this subject. Uh, probably if you already research a little bit on it, you will find Chris Crawford's work. Uh, he's one of the most inspiring men that research on this subject. He actually th coined the term interactive storytelling. If you are new to the subject, you could probably go and find out his book. Uh, an interesting thing about uh, Chris Crawford is that he also is developing a tool named Storytron that you can find at storytron.com and download it. And he's trying to pursue a more linguistical approach to, to the world of interactive storytelling based on the use of verbs. One of the few but great examples of interactive storytelling is this game, that is Facade. Uh, this game was developed by Michael Matthias and Andrew Stern. The, it's a great development, it's a great example. It took five years. It was in the finals of the IGF in 2004, I think. They're actually giving a talk later on today. And they have a more approach based on the, uh, the need of a great artificial intelligence in game development, in, in these type of games. And they have been doing a lot of research on building a great AI tool for interactive storytelling. But it's one of the few great examples I, uh, I, can, I would like to mention about this. There are not that many, unfortunately. So, is it the holy grail of game development? We've been hearing about interactive storytelling slash drama games, etc almost since the birth of this industry. There were many attempts to, to create a genre that, li that links stories and games. Um, one basic example is graphic adventures from the late 80s, early 90s, that were about um, where you use a set of verbs that you use to interact with the scenario and with the characters, and you have a set of props that you could use to link with characters or the scenario. This was the, probably one of the most uh, pioneering genres of that focus on interactive storytelling, but it, they, eventually this genre sort of died, at least. What, that, was, that, that is what some critics say about it. Uh, and modern games try to incorporate storytelling elements in them. Uh, Half-Life, I, I think it's a first-person shooter, it's a very action-based game, but it actually has a very well-written script, very interesting ideas in how to uh, tell a story through a first-person shooter, and also has great technology for facial expression that involves you, gives you a better immersion to the game. And every time I see Half-Life, I wonder why don't they do an a, a interactive storytelling game rather than a first-person shooter with this great technology. But there's the, like the comer from the commercial aspect, there's a need, a clear need that to incorporate uh, drama game tools in, uh, in their developments. Another interesting case, which is not precisely a game, it's a movie, Existence. This movie from David Cronenberg happens in the future, in the year 2020 or something like that. And 
the interesting thing is that the, the, this is sort of a game designer, and you get to play a game that it sort of feels like the, this uh, utopian view we have of interactive storytelling. These are games where you put you in a complex scenarios and complex situations, and you must deal by interacting with actors, and they're not just running and shooting, but very, it has a very drama game approach to how games, these directors see games in the future. Another interesting thing worth mentioning of this movie is that games are played through a, a biological device that gets plugged you in your spinal cord. I don't know if that's the future of game development, but an interesting thing. I would plug myself into one of those, if I'm not already. So what does it matter so much? God made man because he loves stories. And as game designers have this delusion of being gods themselves, they make little artificial worlds in the hope that from these little artificial worlds, our little artificial characters living in this, in this artificial world will emerge some kind of story or rich or profound experience that is uh, uh, interesting and, and tells you something about the human condition. Uh, stories are, are really something very important. They can provoke us and, and, and challenge us on every aspect of our existence. And if you see through any kind of media, whether it's music, uh, movies, literature, uh, philosophy, uh, history, uh, art, uh, pictorial art, uh, any kind of media, you will find stories in any way or another. Uh, stories are essential to our culture and essential to, to the human condition. And stories help to create meaningful experience, which is what we want to create with our games. We want games that, are, that provoke meaningful experiences that, that aren't perceived as a waste of time, but rather as a, hey, this game taught me something interesting about life or changed me in, in a deep way. So what has been happening with games during the last 20, 25, 30 years? Basically, the, the Pac-Man started it all. Pac-Man was this paparazzi photo of, of the Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man. These are the guilty people of, of, of why games have become, or at least the natural first step of game development. Pac-Man was all about killing, eating, and running. We all know that. Pac-Man just went through eating pills and running and, and killing ghosts. And game development, the gaming development industry hasn't changed that much already. We are seeing games today still as kill, eat, and run. They are still trapped in the kill, eat, and run metaphor. And those are very primitive ways of interaction, very primitive ways of play. And humans, at least modern humans and not uh, ancient humans, we have a more complex way of understanding reality and interacting in the social world. We're not, we're not here killing, eating, and running each other. So a lot of the libido of game development has been put in creating great scenarios, great scenarios, great environments, very realistic graphics, beautiful realistic graphics, but not that many uh, uh, richness in the, in the interactivity aspect, which is the core of game development. So we are trapped in this kill, eat, and run metaphor. It's, it's, it can be found in any genre, even in strategy games, where you are supposed to be at a more a complex uh, level of interaction by using uh, management and planning and, in, and executing plans, they're still in the essence, you are managing and executing and et cetera, uh, kill, eat and run units. So we, we do a lot of more things. We use a lot of more verbs than just kill, eat and run in our daily lives and we want games to communicate that. So what I, what I my, my obsession was to create this utopia possible, or at least try to create a path for me to reach this utopia of drama games. So I started with this project that I named Utopia. Originally, the project started two years ago, uh, after having a shower, where I did realize that I wanted to make a political game. I'm, I, I was very interested in politics. I read a lot of writers and a lot of thoughts, thinkers of, poli of politics because like uh, most humans, I think I want to do something for, for my society. And as a game developer, uh, naturally the, the, the way to do it was to make a serious game. No? And the, the, my main concern with political games is that they're, as they're based in strategy, uh, 
you end up abstracted managing military and economical resources, all political games, whether it's civilization or democracy or those kind of games are very much way focused in, the, in managing military and economical resources and you end up abstracted from the real problem. I wanted to, get, to create a game that talks about death penalty, rights for, for gays, abortion, uh, issues that really affects human beings and that really uh, that are real problems in our society and, and I wanted to make a game that talks about that that had a more human approach to, to this so naturally I thought interactive storytelling is a natural way to go stories can, can pr tell something about these very complex issues what en ended up happening was that interactive storytelling was so fun, so interesting, so challenging that the whole project was about making an inter a powerful interactive storytelling tool. That's what I wanted to do. So I, I put all my energies into prototyping tools of any kind about interactive stories, of how to create interactive stories. Of course, the, the world of interactive stories is very big, it's very challenging. There are a lot of issues in artificial intelligence, um, environmental exploration, how you tell a story using metaphors through an environment. There are a lot of things that could be applied to interactive stories. So I decided to focus on one key aspect, which is to me the most important aspect, that is dialogues, conversations, and that is the key aspect of drama. And so I decided to create a set of tools that focus exclusively on dialogues and on, on, on how can we create interesting dialogues within game environments. My main concern was the interface. Uh, a lot of games have interface for making dialogues, but there are some issues, very important issues with this kind of interfaces. The most basic idea of a dialogue interface in a game is this multiple choice uh, 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 kind of dialogue interface. The main problem with this is that it's not very realistic. The feeling, the interactive feeling that you get by doing this kind of dialogues is not very realistic. It's like someone comes talking to me and says, hey, you have to save the world. And I wait like 10 seconds or one minute reading all the options that I have and then I give him the answer. And it's not very, when we are dialoguing with, with each other, when having a conversation with someone, the feedback is on and on. And it's a really quick thing. We, I'm not uh, staring at you blindly and then answer to you. So that, I thought, was a very big problem with this kind of interface. And, and, well, uh, and also it's a very structured, very rigid interface. It's very specific to the, the situation. And there's not much space for emergence in this kind of uh, dialogue interfaces. Modern games such as this, this is a very good game. I like it very much is Indigo Prophecy, also known as Fahrenheit. Uh, this had a more interesting approach. You had a gestural interface. You can see at the top, you have this set of icons, and with the joystick, you put it down, and you said something related to money. You put it to the right, and you drink water, or say something related to water, and so on. It had a more dynamic approach, but yet still it was very limited to the context of the situation that you are living, to the context of that specific story, and it was limited by icons, and by n n there weren't many possibilities to create uh, a, a wide space of interaction within those kind of dialogues. But nonetheless, it was a very interesting game. The other game that I mentioned before, Facade, also, also had a very interesting interface. I didn't put it in the slide, but I'll mention it briefly. Facade the character comes to talk to you and you just type in what you wanted to say. The thing is that when you type in something, you probably take takes it a, long, a longer time than actually saying it. And, and although it was a very natural approach to the interface, uh, I think we need a, a more dynamic thing for interactive dialogues. So the, let's get to the first practical thing of this uh, session. Um, I decided to create a, a, an interactive dialogue interface. So this is the folder. It's in the wrong place. So okay, open. This is the dialogue interface. There's the NPC talking to me right now. Hi there. You came to, here to talk about Utopia. Blah blah blah. 
And that's my character. That lady is the character that I'm playing. And then it comes this interface, which is a Cartesian diagram. And you have in the y-axis, probably it's not very, I'll show it with more detail, a happy face, and on the lower end, a, a sad face, meaning that a positive expression and a negative expression. And in the x-axis, at the left, you have a heart, meaning that you have more emotional response, more uh, uh, impulsive and, and hurt thought response, and on the right side, a more thought response related to the brain, related to a rational aspect. So within this interface, you could tell, uh, here you have a little tip of what the character is about to tell, that no more than two or three words, uh, looks good, how, how it works, I don't know, gives you a tip of what your character might say if you click on that, on that quadrant. And by putting it here, it will have more it will attach a more powerful feeling than if I put the cursor over here. So with one click, I could just say, I want to say this, and with this kind of intensity or, or with this kind of emotional uh, feeling attached to the, to the thing that I want to say. So I can put, I don't know, looks good, a very emotional and very positive response. So my character face goes happy and the dialogue goes yellow. I will go deeper into that further on. Yes, it's quite interesting. I'm excited. Let me know more about it. And then the character answers, blah, blah, blah. So this is the kind of interface I was thinking about. Here's, oops, wrong. This is uh, a zoom for this, the interface. You hear, see love, very emotional and positive. Hate, very emotional and negative. Or yes, very rational and positive. Or no, very negative and, and, and rational. So. Back to PowerPoint. That's the, the basic, the foundational basis of the, these tools that I was thinking for Utopia. But we all know that dialogues aren't just words. There's this myth that says that uh, in human expression, almost 80% of the communication goes through gesture, through, through, uh, through who you are. And, 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 and also, uh, a very important aspect is who is saying. The, 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 the same line. Uh, if I say hasta la vista, baby, I won't say it the same way Arnold Schwarzenegger says it. And that's the key thing of dialogue, is who is saying it. And we need a character creation tool that could create characters in a much more complex and, 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 and interactive storytelling related way. So the natural thing was to create a character casting tool, an avatar tool that permits creating characters not just through the shallow representation of him, but also through his psychological and, and more deep aspects about him. So, this one is over here. Open. Well, these are the set of prototypes that I'll be showcasing today. And here's the actor casting tool. Here you have a set of actors. This is me. And this is Cindy Lauper. And, of course, I could put the name, surname, female, age, what role, uh, a brief description of the character if I want to. And also, of course, I could, uh, like any traditional character tool, I could shape her body or just click random to have fun a little bit. And you have a lot of characters possible in the tool. I have a lot of fun with this tool. Also, you can change the clothes as well, of course. Uh, good looking. And also you can put uh, psychological variables to it. I, was, I decided to base the engine on the Myers-Briggs model, uh, which is pretty well known, I think. I've read a lot about it in the internet, and it's very interesting. In the Myers-Briggs model, you have four basic dichotomies. You have either an introverted character or extroverted character, sensing character against an intuitive character, a thinking character against a feeling character, judging against perceiving. And also you have a stereotype, according to the, all the research that has been done with this kind of psychological model. And if I put all the slides to the right, it tells me that the stereotype this character belongs to is a motivator or a champion, and that belongs to the 8.1% of the world's population. Also, not everything in life is pure science or psychology, if you can consider it a science. You could also put an astrological sign. I mean, you are Aquarius, you are, I don't know, Pisces, 
you just define sort of, this gives you a little bit of randomness and that mystery of life that, that we all, as living beings, try to understand too. And of course, we want, I want the, 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 the character system to be flexible enough to have expressions in them. You see, you can put in happy face, sad face, angry face. And the idea of utopians is we, we don't need realistic graphics to, come, to, to show an emotion, to show an expression. My idea was to let us put them very big heads and very big eyes and nose and mouth and eyebrows so that you can clearly see the emotion. That's what, what my artistical approach was to, to these kind of characters. So that's the reason why they have such big faces and, and little bodies, and also because they're good looking. So this character casting tool gives me a set of characters with a psychological profile that it's attached to the interface. For example, I, an INTP type of character won't react the same way as an ESFJ character through the Myers-Briggs uh, system of psychological classification. So characters may react differently according to the kind of response that I'm giving to them. So what about gesture? Uh, we have characters, you, you've seen the, 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 the little utopians with, with a happy, sad, and angry face, a neutral face, but truth is that there are many, many ways of, uh, many kinds of emotions and expressions. You can have an ironical look, you can have a, um, I don't know, uh, you can be a bluff look, uh, any kind of adjective could be attached to a kind of expression. And, I couldn't make an engine that is capable of predicting all the kinds of emotions a story writer might want to express in his game. So I decided we need a tool precisely to create emotions. And, and because psychological emotions are so vast, I decided to create this little tool. Mm. This is the motions, Emotions Director. In the Emotions Director, you have an emotions palette. I decided to attach emotions to colors, which felt to me the most natural way. And you have the intensity of the emotion. You can count emotions, which are more desaturated colors, or more excited emotions, which are more saturated colors. And also, these emotions are related to the positive, negative, emotional, rational axis that is the core of, the, of, st of this storytelling tool. So I could click on this emotion over here, and I have a very happy, rational face. Satisfaction is the name of this emotion. Uh, let's see, this one is angry, and it's angry emotion. And I could just shape this emotion any way I want to. I could decide to, to modify this just like like that, animate it a little bit, put an expression act, set this sort of animation tools. And also make a preview. I could select an actor. Uh, I could put, I will put myself. And I could test the animation. Uh, probably I should move this eye a little bit. And I could create any kind of complex emotions with this tool, I mean, the idea is to have a flexible tool to create multiple emotions of any kind and, and, and try to transmit the subtleties of irony or, I don't know, you think of any kind of emotional expression. That's the idea of, of behind this tool. So, so how are the stories written? You have characters, we have uh, an interface to interact with them, we have emotions, but we need these stories to be written. And traditionally, well, this is a brief mention, you might know this already, games have three basic ways of modeling stories. Linear stories, which is the most common type, uh, branched or hierarchical stories, where you have, according to the set of decisions that you take, 
you get to wander through through the options. And modular stories where you create tiny bits of, of, of chapters and you can remix them any way, any possible way, and the stories still make sense, which is one of the most challenging ways of writing stories, but it's not that challenging once you get a grip on it. So the story writer is based on these three basic structures for storytelling, and my main concern is that I want this tool to be used by storytellers. I don't want to make a tool that is used by programmers, by game developers, designers, or gamers. I want this tool to be used by storytellers. I'm not quite there yet. The interface is not that great. But I'm still trying to work hard to, to make a good tool for, to let people write stories easily. Um, so here it goes. In the story writer, you have story walls, which is a term used by Chris Crawford, which I like. It's very interesting. We have the story utopia by myself. And we have context. We can define co any set of context. I don't know, fight or uh, a job interview or, I don't know, a conference in the GDC, any kind of context. And within this context, we can define chapters, which are XML files, very simple XML files. All the game is using XML formats. Uh, we can edit this. Are you sure you want to? Yeah, I'm sure. I could, well, set a scenario, put the character anywhere, uh, and there you go. Uh, over the couch. Uh, randomly change it. And, and I can go to edit the script. So the script starts here at the main, main chapter. You can see the interface once again, positive, negative, emotional, rational. And according to the decision, it takes me to another part of the story, and this is an ending. This is a very basic structure for a story. And I could click on Edit, and I could change the name, the, what the NPC is going to say, which, which emotion he's going to use to say, and you can see the color of the emotion. And well, here is the axis and the responses that you want to put in here. Option name, and well, what your, the, the player's character is going to say. Um, well, with this, ideally, you you could create stories of any kind. You can see now the main loop has changed. Yeah. So these are the tools for Utopia. These are the tools that I've been prototyping all this time. Um, Utopia has been going on for two years as a part-time project, uh, but. I wanted to take the project to a new phase. I got support from the government of Buenos Aires and from some other entities. And uh, a lot of things has changed from the last two years. A lot of philosophical issues on developing for the computers has changed and made natural to, for this kind of project to have a new platform and, and under a new philosophy for this, really, this thing to really take off. So. I decided to change the name. It will be the name Play Dreamer. That's, is, this is going to be a tool. And it's going to be open source. And it's going to be web-based. And, and I want it to be uh, accessible by anyone. And if you go to playdreamer.com, you will find a manifesto saying why this is important for us who believe in stories and games. And you will find a dogma that tries to put some guidelines to how these games at least should be. Um, this is a very, this is a, a tool that I, I'm willing to put all this, the projects, all the prototypes you've seen today, the source code and the projects will be able to be downloaded. I'll just offer them to the world and see what the world makes with them. And to those who believe in, in that games should be about great graphics and, and great realistic worlds and simulation, this immersive fallacy that Frank Lance mentioned last year, the immersive fallacy of creating a, an, a virtual reality that is, that is just like reality itself makes no sense to me. So uh, I, li I really like this phrase, the world is made of stories, not atoms. So thanks. Um, Contact me.
Uh, any questions? I don't know if we have enough time. Patrick? Hey, I have a few questions. Um, first of all, how are you planning on monetizing this framework? I'm not doing it for the money. Uh, I, I'm, for the money, I'm doing other things. I'm doing oh, okay. this for the love of art. So there's no license fee attached? There's no, I just... No, this... I don't know. I don't want money from this. I, I, I want to create a, a nice tool. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not honest, honestly, I'm doing it for the money. I fortunately have a great job. I have a great job. Uh, I don't need more money for this. All right. Well, that's uh, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Well, then, uh, you know, since we're in the Serious Game Summit, um, it seems to me like Serious Games, which aren't trying to go for deeply recombinant, you know, deeply patterned experiences that you can play over and over again, but, you know, especially in the training segment, where they're just trying to get you through a structured experience that you play through one time to get, uh, you know, a customer service principle across or safety or whatever. Do you think this uh, would be particularly well suited to that? Um. My, I would love to see this tool used in education. Uh, I would like to you, historians use it as a way to put you in historical situations and learn history through virtual history exercises. Um, I, if you, can, you could use it for, to train customer service system, but uh, I don't care about customer service. They are quite good already. We don't know. I have very good attention when I call to support. I, I want good education. That's my main concern, and I think it's a nice tool to create to tell stories, to create, to, to, to inspire people, to create games, to prototype games, to use it in your big scale games and see how a story would work out. Or if you are new to games, or, or if you, I, I would like to see story writers, uh, people from the literature world using this kind of tool. Um, uh, I don't know. You could use it for learning systems and that kinds of things. All right, thanks. Okay. Any final question? No? Nothing? Okay, you can contact me. I, oh. Do you have already like a community base working on this kind of stuff? Or, like, okay. Yeah, all of you. All of you. <laughs> that's, that's my community. If there's a community, no. There, I, I, I'm really surprised. A lot of people came, uh, so I'm very glad to see there's an interest in, in this kind of uh, features for games. So uh, I, I'm, I'm inviting anyone to, to come to this website and see what happens. Can you um, tell us what you built this game in? Sorry? Can you say what you built this in? Was it done in Flash? Oh, uh, the, the, yeah, Flash. Uh, I love Flash. It's a very nice tool to make quick developments, and it was made in Flash. Probably the open source tool would be made in Flash and Flex and those kind of web-friendly systems. One of the things I've always found very challenging in making um, games that model emotion is exactly trying to map emotions into a space. You've picked your two-axis system, and then you seem to have the sort of modifications with color, etc. Did you find... How, how satisfied are you with how it came out? Are you able to do everything you want? Are there... Do you see strengths and weaknesses of the system? I will be very subjective and I'll say I am very satisfied. <laughs> uh, honestly, I, I've seen other approaches. Um, uh, I can't say, honestly. It's, 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 that's an answer that has to give, be given by the players. And Well, we have no time, I think. Grab me here and I'll be your bitch. <laughs>